Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry for this delay, and thank you for being here for this presentation. Uh, so, I am uh, very happy to be here, and I will uh, present to you uh, a little bit of uh, our work. It's just uh, a general vision of what we are doing in Belfort. So, I am Nadia Yusfischsteiner. I'm a full professor at the Université Bourgogne Franche-Comté. So, uh, my university is located in Belfort. Uh, so, which is a city of, uh, which is located in the eastern part of France. Uh, if you look in here, uh, it's uh, somehow very close to the borders between Switzerland and uh, Germany. We are about at 25 kilometers from each of the countries, uh, very nicely located. And you may have heard about Belfort, about the very famous uh, lion, which is the symbol of Belfort. Uh, symbol of the resistance of, uh, of um, friends uh, back then. Uh, and I won't be surprised if uh, you don't, you already heard about a big festival in Belfort. This is uh, the biggest one in France, a rock festival, which lasted for a week, uh, usually starting of July. So uh, this is just to locate to you where I am and what I am doing in Belfort. I am doing research and teaching. So uh, from the research point of view, I'm, be I'm belonging to an institute which is named FEMTO ST. Uh, so this is a mixed research uh, unit of the CNRS, which is the National uh, Center of Research in France. And I'm belonging uh, more particularly to a department which is energy. And inside this department, we have two teams, one which is dealing more about thermal energy and the other one more about hydrogen. I will talk a little bit about this later. And I'm also a member of uh, a federation. This is the fuel cell lab. This is a federation of different labs. Uh, I will also talk a little bit about this uh, federation. From uh, For teaching, so I'm teaching uh, in the Master of Hydrogen Energy and Energy Efficiency. I'm also the head of this master since last year. And I'm also the head of another master, which is more general electrical engineering master. And also, uh, I, I belong to the French Federation of Hydrogen. This is a federation, national federation that gathers all the institutes that are working on hydrogen in France. And I'm dealing more particularly with another colleague about the mobility access within this federation. And we are also working, uh, I'm leading a, a working group that is uh, uh, trying to define roadmap for sustainable mobility in France uh, by 2050. Uh, about my background, so um, uh, I have a background on applied mathematics, on physics and energetics. Uh, so I had this master in 2006. After that, I did my PhD in Germany in uh, one institute which is named European Institute for Energy Research about diagnostics of fuel cell. So it was mainly non-intrusive diagnostics using mathematical tools and using the list of sensors as possible. And after that, I, I was hired there as a, a project manager, of, always in this uh, topic about fuel cell, electrolyzer, and hydrogen project until 2014, where I joined uh, the University of Franche-Comté as an associate professor on a six-year share of excellence. And uh, today, so and since 2020, I'm full professor at the same university. So this is about the general presentation. Of me, and then uh, this is the the platform, the FC Lab, and within there is the teams of M2ST. So you can see here the building. Uh, so this FC Lab, uh, I, I said that, that it was a federation, but actually it, it has changed since uh, January last year. So beside being a federation, we are today also delivering services. This is just a change of status of the, the federation. So we still have the same activity, but we are adding one dimension, which is the services on this activity. So uh, the fuel cell lab, uh, there is eight public organizations, member of this uh, fuel cell lab, two of them at, at the national level, which is the CNRS and the IFSTA, which is the um, uh, National Institute about Transportation. And there are also organizations at the regional level, schools and universities that are also members of FC Lab. Today, we are about 140 researchers. And among these 140, there is about 60 PhD students, which are permanently here. And uh, as for statistics, we have more than 85 uh, PhD that has been defended since uh, uh, 2002, which is the creation of the FC Lab. 
And today we are also working with different projects, different type of projects. We are uh, around, this is just a mean value, so we are um, around three, uh, 30 funded, uh, public funded projects, whether it is a big project like European projects or smaller project that could be just a cooperation within industry. So the mission of, uh, of uh, the FC Lab, uh, so they are the same as the Federation, maybe just the last one, which is a new. Uh, so we are working to promote fuel cell and hydrogen by research and development, of course, participating to this research project and assisting industry uh, regarding fuel cell through industrial project and collaboration. And the last dimension that is more the service part, uh, we are now uh, also dedicated to offer services, whether it is to academia or industry. Uh, kind of services that we deliver is like prospects and studies, uh, contract, but also uh, given experimental means, we can uh, rent some labs or some test benches or also even people to go and do some experimental for industry that is around here. Uh, so this facility, so this is the building, as you can see here, uh, there is three floors. So the two first floors are mainly offices, shared offices between different teams from different laboratories. And on the, um, on the basic level, on the ground level, we have about 1,200 uh, square meters of dedicated area for testing. Uh, we have different uh, test benches going from 50 watt to 30 kilowatt. So we don't test really single cells. We are going from small stacks to systems. And we have also mobile uh, FC test, uh, fuel cell test bench. Mainly it's a, it's a truck where we can uh, test different uh, components, uh, fuel cell, uh, supercapacitors, batteries, and there we can validate under real operating conditions some strategies of control or energy management or dimensioning and so on. We are also uh, doing some long duration tests, uh, 24 hours, seven day, under actual operating conditions, uh, under cycling and so on. So we can see here we have a uh, vibrating table and climate chamber, and we can combine both so that we can have some operation under real conditions. And since January this year, we had also uh, a new test bench that can go uh, until uh, 120 kilowatt for testing stacks and up to 150 kilowatt for testing system, the whole system. And, uh, and this will be mainly uh, a support to test a full stacks from industry that are producing. In the area, we have some bio fuel cell uh, that are uh, very close to us and um, other industry as well. So this is just for the context and where I come from. And I will start my presentation with a question, but I don't think that I have to convince you because I think we share the same Im uh, images and, uh, and uh, motivation. So why are we interested in hydrogen? So the way we see it is that climate, ha having to preserve the climate and um, having access to energy are a common challenge, which is worldwide. And we believe that hydrogen can help achieving that, first of all, because it, it helps to reduce the dependency to fuel cell. It reduces the emission of greenhouse gases. And, and this is most important. It, have, it is a solution to store energy and therefore facilitate the integration of renewable uh, sources, deployments, and also their integration into the global energy system. So fuel cell, of course, are a clean alternative to what we have as conventional, but there are st still some issues. We saw this also yesterday, so we can see uh, first of one, which is almost a shift. So this is uh, a diagram that comes from objective of the Department of Energy, where we can see that uh, we still have to work on uh, efficiency, uh, on cost and, uh, and uh, even if we know that uh, cost will come also with increasing the volume of production uh, and also on durability. So there are some objectives to, uh, to reach, which are 5,000 hours for uh, light duty vehicles in 2023 and 80,000 hours in 2025 for more stationary applications. So this is um, actually, th this comes from the multi-annual work plan, but this is a shared uh, objective also with other countries. This is European, but it comes also from other countries. So these are, let's say, the three main issues that we are working on. Uh, in my lab, we are a lot focusing on durability, but of course, we are not neglecting uh, all this, uh, the three aspects. So while we are 
developing durability, we don't do it uh, at the expense of the cost of the performance. So we, we try to uh, do it by lowering the cost and increasing the performance. Uh, there is another aspect which is also very important, uh, which is the social, socio-technological uh, transition. Uh, and in our lab, we have a team that is specially dedicated to that, that work with us and supports us in our project. And the idea here is to have an integration of this new technology inside the society. So we usually talk about acceptance, but this is a word that they don't like because um, acceptance means that the technology is there and we have to make the public accepted while the idea of this team is to work uh, in amongst, uh, before the project and integrate uh, these parameters before designing a solution uh, so that we have a participation also inside the solution. So uh, this integration can go through different ways information to the large public, um, but also there is a way which is, a, there is a mean which is very important is that to work on code standards and regulation. Uh, so we don't work on this in the lab, but we have an institute that we are collaborating with uh, that is uh, in the region very close and they work mainly on the storage. Uh, so they are, they are uh, delivering uh, homologation for uh, fuel cell tanks, but they are also working on the regulation codes and standards as well. So, uh, so f regarding the durability, so during fuel cell operation, of course, performance will decrease because of many reasons, fuel cell aging, improper operating conditions, fault incidents. So that brings us to some scientific questions. This is the question we try to answer. So how to increase the lifetime um, without rising the cost? Uh, it's even by, by the, by decreasing the cost. And the other question is how to guarantee a good reliability of my fuel cell system and how to ensure a continuity of service for this fuel cell system, especially for some critical application where the continuity of service is very important. So we have one possible solution that we have been developing, which is the prognostics and health management, and I will present this later on. So before going to that, um, the notion of durability, and I used to explain it more in France because the word can have different meaning. So here we define it as the capacity of the system to respond to required functionalities under certain conditions of operation and maintenance until reaching uh, the end of lifetime. And there is different way uh, to increase the durability. We can either increase it at the level of stack design, at the stack assembly or at the stack operation. So for the first one, the durability is linked to the studied system. It depends on the architectures we, cho we choose or the material we choose. Uh, while for the second one, it is intrinsic to the way we are assembling our stacks. And the, the last one, uh, it is linked to the way we are actually using the stack that, that is condition of operation, environment, whether it, there is vibration or uh, uh, weather or anything else. For the first one, the reduction will go through reduction of components costs, developing new material, low cost material, and the durability will also go by developing durable materials. For the second one, uh, the reduction will go by improving the quality assurance of my system and increasing uh, the volume of fabrication. And the third one, uh, we, are, we are going to reach a durability, uh, a reduction of costs, sorry, by having a more efficient operation. And also uh, from, uh, from a durability point of view, we, we will try to improve the operating conditions. And this is the part that we are uh, working on mainly. Of course, it is very important to have development at the tree level. And uh, I think that the development should be concomitant so that we have different validation. Uh, but for, we are mainly focusing here and we have different other uh, um, partners uh, with whom we are working on other aspects. So this is just a fuel cell system. Of course, I will not uh, stay long on this. We have the cell, the stack and the system that allows all this to, to work. What is important here is that uh, a fuel cell system is a complex system. We can see that we have different phenomena with different natures. So we have a multi-physics system. Uh, and this phenomena have multi scale, multi, um, al, uh, sorry, multiple time constants. So we are, we have a multi-scale system with strong interaction that makes it, makes it a complex system, which means that there is a need, 
uh, to have different models from different objectives, uh, either it is for optimization, design, control. And for that, we need to master these mechanisms of operation. Uh, that is also a mechanism of degradation and mechanism of faults. If I focus a little bit on faults and degradation, so this is this is a very old uh, table. You are not supposed to read it, to read it, but it is just to show different uh, faulty modes that could appear inside the stack, and to see the different causes, consequences, but also if we can control them and if they are re reversible or not. And this is very important if we want to control our system. And we can see that there are not many that are reversible. Even those ones, they are reversible under certain, certain conditions. Uh, the, the vast majority are uh, not reversible. So uh, this is also mainly due to the kind of system we are dealing with. Uh, if I have, for example, one fault, at the system level, let's say on the supply of hydrogen. So this fault can propagate until the stack and given some faulty modes that we are here, uh, degradation of the catalyst that is irreversible. So the idea here is that we have a system uh, that is a multi-component system with different BOP components. And we have a strong uh, fault propagation between uh, the BOP components and the stack. And this is also something that needs uh, to be masters because because a small fault at a BOP component can have a big consequences at the stack. So here I have just uh, a, uh, a graph that is showing an aging test that we, we have been doing in the lab. So we can see uh, a smooth irreversible loss of power. There are some fluctuations, but this is still, um, let's say, a perfect aging test. Uh, so this is something that has been done in the lab, uh, while on the reality, we have something like that. That means that we have some uh, smooth decay of the, of, the, uh, of the power, here power losses, but we have also some recoveries from time to time. And these recoveries are mainly due to uh, faults or to characterization, to startup, to stop. So this is actually what we have in general, that the overall performance decay is a mixture, is a combination between both, uh, between a gradual drop, which is really due to aging, and between some reversible uh, decay and recoveries. And this is something which is not easy because we have a strong interaction between both. That means that the rate of degradation, this aging, will depend strongly on the fault condition. If I have several fault conditions, then it will accelerate the aging. And at the same time, if I have a fault, uh, I know that for sure it have more chance to appear at the end of the life. Like for example, flooding, uh, we will see it more frequently at the end of the life because I have more degrade material. So here the challenge and the objective that we are setting is to avoid faults and minimize degradation on the same time. So avoid this, uh, we need diagnostic solution that is detecting, identifying a fault once it appears, after it appears. And for that, we use the diagnostic output to increase the reliability. And we need prognostic solution that is estimating at each moment the future operation and deducing the residual lifetime of my system. And we use this output to decrease the degradation and therefore increase uh, the durability. So the difficulty here is to master this uh, strong interaction between both. And at the first stage, we just do the hypothesis, which is a big one, that the diagnostics do not take account uh, the aging and the prognostics ignore any faults occurring. Of course, this hypothesis will be um, leveraged after that, but this is the first starting point uh, for, for that work. So this is quite um, similar to what has been presented yesterday. So these are the steps that we are using. First, understand, analyze the situation uh, and the system that we are studying. So we have several tools, whether it is uh, uh, fault trees or a diagram of causes, structural analysis. Uh, so And that would allow us to identify the relevant parameters for a situation to monitor and detect also isolate the component that has a problem. After that, we will try to model the behavior of the system, that is faults or degradation. Here, degradation is mainly aging, accelerated aging. Uh, 
and identify the current states. So this is done by uh, the state of health. And actually here, the state of health include the, 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 uh, the fault and the aging at the same time. After that, we will predict the future health behavior and state and estimate the residual lifespan, which is the prognostics. If the state is failing, then we will identify which fault, decide the settings, and send this to the controller so that they can change it. So this is uh, combining decision and control. And if the state is degraded, I can see some aging uh, occurring, then identify the combination of operating parameters that will maximize the remaining useful lifetime. Uh, and this is the role of my prognostics model. And of course, if the last steps, the two last steps are not possible, just call for the maintenance. And here we have two types of maintenance. Uh, we have post-diagnostics maintenance and post-prognostics maintenance. So this is the general approach. Uh, we have our system. We implement some diagnostics that will give us a state of health. And this state of health is fed to the prognostics that will, uh, for my diagnostics, my, prognos uh, my diagnosis uh, will give me a decision, which is called post-diagnostics decision. My prognostics will take historical data to give also other decision, which is post-prognostics decision. And here we will have different choices. Yes. Either maintenance or um, changing the control. So here we have a new layer that we call monitoring, a layer of supervision, and another layer, which is the execution. And of course, we have to combine this with uh, inspection of the system. So I will just show you some examples uh, about different works on, on here. So for the diagnostics part, so this is uh, the structure of our prognostics and health management. Um, actually, it's not recent anymore. It's, uh, I have to change that. So it's now more than 10 years that we are using this. Um, it is uh, it's, it's 10 years that we are using it in fuel cell. Of course, the method itself is older than that. And the idea is that we have to monitor, to analyze and master uh, the remaining useful lifetime of any system here in our case is the, the fuel cell. So this is uh, the first step, which is diagnostics. Uh, so we have uh, fault and detection, the fault detection and identification module. And here we have different approaches, whether uh, it is based on the model, whether or as we call it without model, but actually there is always a model behind it. The, the main difference is that here we are generating and analyzing some residual, which we don't here do here because here we are doing some pattern recognitions approaches for that. And we have also some approach, which is more uh, expert system approach. Here in the last one, it's more a qualitative approach rather than the others that are quantitative. So for us, the module of diagnostics has uh, three levels of constraints. So the first one is the constraint uh, at system level. So of course, these are linked to the system we are using. In, in a fuel cell system, the limitation are techno technical economic limitation. As we said, limiting the cost, limiting the volume, the weight, and so on. The second constraint is on the module itself where we need to measure its uh, performance. And that goes uh, by classical metrics, uh, which are measuring like rate of good detection, false alarm, and so on. And we need also to evaluate the ability of my model to be robust, reliable, to have a low computational cost because we need to implement it uh, online, uh, real time for some faults, and also if it is really applicable uh, on my system or not. And the third one is to, in the integration of this model on my system and judge if the implementation capacity of, of this uh, module inside the system, inside the, um, the system, and it is mainly inside the, my fault tolerance control, uh, so, for example, my control decision is mainly uh, relying on the output of the fault detection and identification models. So, uh, is it reliable enough? Uh, do I have information uh, um, fast enough to correct my faults and so on? Which sensor do we need? 
and uh, and also uh, which information I'm given besides the occurrence of faults, the type of faults, should I give other information like amplitude, severity, and things like that. So uh, taking into account this constraint, so we, um, we choose not to use the first one uh, simply because uh, it is strongly because it is very precise, but it lack of, um, it is not very fast. The ability of generalization is not that easy and it is not that simple to implement. So we choose to use in our work, these two classes of diagnostics with of course the challenge that uh, as we need more reliable diagnostics, so we use some reinforcement, um, we need also some generic uh, tools. So we, for example, we try to extend the, the tools we are using to different types of fuel cells, different technologies, either other electrochemical devices. And also we need to adapt them to uh, operation in real system. So here I will just present to you one type of the work we are doing, uh, which is this one based on, uh, on the analysis of signal. And uh, so the motivation from behind this work is that um, we choose to use wavelet analysis for that because uh, it is a time scale model. And uh, the idea of choosing that is that we have the coexistence of phenomena at different scales. So the wavelet analysis would allow us to separate the signal, uh, whatever the signal is, of course, we have to choose the signal, uh, but it will separate it into different scales and go and analyze each uh, one by himself and try to take the information of that. More generally, without entering the, into detail, so the principle of the wavelet transform is that we have a wavelet, so this is what you are seeing here. So it's a, a, sh a short signal in time, limited in time. Um, it starts from zero and then we have an oscillation and, and at zero. So this is what we call sometimes wavelet mother. And then from this signal, we can generate different other uh, signals. We call them a base of signals or wavelet family. So we will generate from this same signal by stretching it and, um, and uh, so changing the frequency and changing the localization. And we will multiply our signal. So this is a correlation between our signal and this family. So the idea here is to choose a family that is separated enough so that we cover the whole uh, spectrum of the information without having gaps and sometimes without having redundancy. So when we choose carefully uh, this family of wavelets, we can cover the whole signal and take in all the information in it. This is what we use, for example, for this ability to, um, to cover the whole signal without gap. This is how we can use it, for example, in reconstruction of speeches and, uh, and of images, uh, because I can, uh, the transformation is reversible. I can go back to my signal after decomposing it. So uh, this is the mathematical formula, but in practice, when we choose uh, judiciously this wavelet, of course, um, occurring a transformation of wavelets, uh, it's the same as I take my signal and I pass it through uh, different filters. And each time separating uh, low frequencies from high frequencies. And I do that uh, as much as I need, depending on my application, my signal. So this is what we call level of decomposition. For example, here we have three levels of decomposition. And usually I just do it on the, I, I continue the decomposition only on the um, low frequency signals. But here, uh, this is what we call wavelet packet. So we decompose at the same time, the low frequency and the high frequency, because usually we have a lot of information in the high fre frequency signal as well. So for example, if I take one signal that we have, so this is the result of our decomposition. And I will just show you um, one, one case that we have done for, for flooding. So here, this is a, a, an evolution of uh, voltage in that case. Sometimes we use also power. Evolution of voltage. And we did a decomposition with a wavelet at level seven. So I'm not representing everything here. And of course, what we obtain is uh, different uh, decomposition, different levels with different frequency ranges. Of course, at each level, I have the same information. It's the same signal. It is just that I'm separating the frequency differently. And that means that I have redundant information. If I take all the information here, I have the same information. It is just represented differently. 
So what I do is that from each packet, so this little signal, we call them uh, wavelet packets. So from each packet, I will extract some information like statistical criteria, maximum, minimum, or other criteria on energy, entropy, frequencies as well. So a certain number of, uh, of uh, criteria. And I will put them together, and that will be my representation basis. So this is how I will represent my signal. After that, what I do is that as this representation will be highly redundant, I will do some approaches to eliminate as much as possible this redundancy so that my uh, representation basis is simplified and I will keep only the data that is relevant for my objective. Uh, what is important to know is that data is uh, is always relevant depending on our objective. Here it is the diagnostic, so I will evaluate it uh, towards diagnostic. So for example, here, this is another example where I could use some sequential choices with validation on diagnostics and where I could divide my basis by two. So when I have, once I have this, uh, this new representation basis of data, so I will try to classify it here, for example, these are the relevant packet that comes from um, from flooding. And this will be uh, what we call the signature of flooding. And then it will be the basis of comparison between each new sample. I will just compare it to this signature. So here we have the, some classification tool that we implemented. And of course, the criteria are based that if I have the two samples that uh, belong to the same class, I will try to minimize the distance between them. And if they are a different class, I will try at the same time to maximize the distance. So these are uh, classical criteria from classification algorithm. And this is how, for example, we could improve um, using this. We could have some results that, was, that were really uh, nice regarding the databases because uh, it's not always easy to generate faults. We think that we are generating fault, but we don't know exactly if it is really a default. Uh, we try to generate uh, flooding, but then we have some cells that are flooded and other that are dried. So it's really very, very complicated. So um, having reliability at 85% is already very good regarding this, uh, this experiment. So this is just one, one, um, one method that we are using on, on diagnostics. And just to show you, because uh, one objective was to generate, uh, generalize this method to other technologies. Uh, so here we tried also to use the same approach um, on, on SOFCs, and we tried to have other type of descriptors that is coming from this transformation. Uh, so we have some criterion based on the energy of the, this little packet of signals, and we have some entropy. The, the energy will characterize the fluctuation that I have in my signal and the entropy, the disorder. And we apply it for uh, a test on aging of SOFC here, for example. And I can show you the result is that we, um, that showed up that uh, the entropy is a good indication for, um, for aging of SOFC signal. So this is just a, a simple example about the diagnostics part. So I will show you also some works on the prognostics. So this is the next step here. Uh, so of course, this is the classical definition. Prognostics means that we are able uh, to project the future behavior of the system and also assess at each time. So this is the time where I, I, I trigger my prognostics. It's the status of health uh, depending on the way am I, I am using it. And what is important here is what we call the remaining useful lifetime, which is the estimation of the time between the moment where I trigger my prognostics and the moment where I decide that my system is failing. And this is, of course, something that is completely dependent on the system and on the application. Uh, for today, we, we still lack uh, some definitions on that. But uh, this is how we proceed. So this is the threshold. This is the, the limit. Here we decide that our system is failing. And I have uh, some measurements of my degradation state. Here we can imagine voltage or power or any other indicator like the resistance or whatever. And this is just a simplification because this degradation state, it, it, has, it doesn't have to be one dimensional. We can have it on different dimensions. So this is just one dimension for this representation. 
So uh, my algorithm will learn from this measurement until this T where I will project and predict from this learning phases my uh, future behavior. This is very simple, of course, simplified. And uh, I, will, I will define my remaining useful lifetime as the distance between the time I ask for the prognostics and the time my prediction reaches the end of the life that has been defined. Here, of course, we are talking about something that is happening in the future. So, of course, this is associated with uh, uncertainties. And it raises some question about how to tune these prognostics. Do we have enough knowledge data? How to validate it? That means how to judge a priori of the quality of um, one prediction without actually the failure happens. So here for, for, for measure, measuring our performance of the prognostics, of course, we want our prognostic to be robust, reliable, and that is applicable on my real application. So this is the classical criteria. But also, uh, there is the, the measurement of the algorithm itself, how well this algorithm is uh, operating. So, and this is the value of the remaining useful lifetime, time to failure. And of course, we should associate some uncertainty, some confidence interval uh, that will assess the risk taken by giving this value. The second uh, measurement of this is the performance of the algorithm itself. So this is just the measurement of distance between the real useful lifetime that we have and the one predicted by the algorithm. And here we have different uh, definition, classical definition of errors on the model. So this is how we, we uh, validate it. And of course, something which is very important, there is also um, another way is that uh, going through accelerated stress test, because uh, of course, if we need to validate uh, an algorithm that predicts 5,000 hours of uh, operation, so we need really reliable accelerated stress test for that. So here, just the challenges uh, of prognostics in fuel cell systems. So as I said before, the loss of performance can be different nature, either reversible or not. And to use uh, to, to use my prognosis algorithm, I need to have only the irre irreversible one. That means that I need to feed my prognostics with uh, the state of health, with the fault, so that we can remove the reversible parts. And this is, of course, difficult to separate both, but this is a challenge. Uh, degradation can be generated at different scales. And here, the idea is to use different source of information uh, history, inspection at different level. I will talk a little bit. So this is the, the example I will give on prognostics. And uh, degradation can be generated by different sources, stack and auxiliary. And here the idea is to make a prognostics at the whole system level. So I will have a prognostics on the stack, but also on the compressor, on the humidifier, and then define uh, a global remaining useful life uh, time of the system, whether it is uh, the first Component that fails uh, means that all the system fails. So this is uh, uh, something to define um, regarding the system we are dealing with. And finally, the validation. And this is what I said before, evaluate the, this prediction error uncertainties and putting in place some tests, some accelerated stress tests also to validate all this. So if I go here just to the back to the issue with reversible, uh, versus irreversible here. Uh, the degradation can be reversible and here we can have some parts which are recovered and that lead us to some phenomena, rejuvenation phenomena. And here there is um, a good work on that where they are also trying to use uh, the understanding there is behind this phenomena to include it also in the control so that we can extend the lifetime. Now, if we go to the measurements of the degradation, so there are two types of measurements. Uh, the first one, which is the classical, it's a continuous monitoring of the system, classical external measurements, power, voltage. Uh, these are uh, low cost measurements, but they are of poor quality. And we can see here that uh, measuring only the voltage is not enough to see uh, the, the degradation. Now, if we go to other type of measurements, uh, this inspection, what we call internal characterization, like IV curves or um, uh, EIS, these measurements are of better quality because I can access to more information, but they are 
high, higher cost. So the question here is how to improve my prognostics to add some better quality information in it, but still uh, limiting the cost of measurement. And this is why I wanted to present to you on prognostics this, this work that has been um, dealing with multi-level prognostics. So for example, here, we can see that we have the performance loss over the time. And this is the, the degradation path. And this degradation path will change depending on the different causes of this aging. So the causes here are represented in green and in red. So these are two different causes that will accelerate or decelerate the degradation. But these covariates are internal variable that we cannot access just with this performance indicator. So um, what we, we say that this information is very important if I want to project my performance degradation. So I need to access this and uh, to access them, I need some inspection. So the inspection uh, here could be under different forms. I can just go on without inspection and I know that I'm lacking information to have uh, reliable enough prognostics, or I can have two types of inspection. The one is periodic. That means we have an interval which is fixed of inspection. And the other one, what we call the online inspection, that means that is triggered by the error I have on my uh, algorithm. For example, here, you see the, uh, the degradation here. So this is my degradation path in blue. Uh, in red, if I go on without inspection, so I have no information about what is causing my degradation. And in red, I have inspection. So that means um, when I see that this error is growing, I will ask to go and pick up this value. So I do the inspection and I feed my algorithm. Here the algorithm has more information and he updates update the parameters. And we can see that the red one is going slowly towards the, the real one. And we continue. And when this error is above the threshold, I will again trigger an inspection. So it's like triggering the inspection on demand um, according to the value of error I have. Of course, this, is ha this has a cost and I need also to monitor the cost. So for us, the cost is... Um, the, the sum of two different parts. The first one is the number of inspection because this is costly and not only in terms of, uh, of money because I'm using hydrogen, but also in terms of degradation. We have some inspection that's also cause degradation to the system as I, ha I have to go through high um, frequencies or I have to uh, go through different operating points. So the cost can be either uh, on efficiency, but also on degradation. And the second part is the penalty of the estimation of error. For example, here for my green one, where I went without inspection at all, my penalty is maximum because I have maximized my error. So this is the, the cost that we have set and we try to validate this on, on a system. And we can see, for example, here, this is the accuracy. Uh, of course, the accuracy is better when I have a periodic inspection because I have uh, different times where I go to pick up the information and I update my algorithm. So here I will be more accurate. Of course, I will be less accurate for when I have no inspection. So this is the, the weight of adding information to my algorithm. Of course, my error is maximum when I have no inspection. When I have periodic one, I will uh, lower the error and this is in between. And here, uh, this is the number of inspection that has been used. Of course, it is maximum when I'm using periodic um, uh, inspections and zero when I'm no using nothing. And which is most important here for the cost, uh, we can see that uh, online inspection will lower my cost regarding to these two ones. So um, the idea here is really to find the compromise between how much information I need, how much solicitation I do to my system and do this online. Uh, and this is the, the work that has been done on this. Um, so just a conclusion to that, I, I will not go through the other parts, but of course I will be available if there is any questions to talk about other approaches, but it was just to give you one example of each. And here, the idea of this work is to demonstrate the value of the knowledge uh, of state of health for prognostics performance. So this state of health, if we take only 
uh, faults or if we take only degradation, it's not enough. So we need also to have a rich value of that. And for example, internal inspection with multi-level prognostics would be a solution. The idea also is to go towards parsimonious uh, prognostics, which is also robust, reduction of the cost of the system and limiting the degradation by limiting unnecessary characterization of my system. And finally, moving towards a robust and accurate prognostics without prior uh, data preprocessing. So we here we use the, um, the raw data directly without needing any other process. So if I have to conclude this part, uh, I have, um, so from the measurement part, uh, there is a real need. I, I heard this yesterday on the, on the meeting we had. Yes, there is a real need on having relevant indicator of the degradation. It could be one or it could be different indicators. Is that external variables, internal one? And uh, for example, if it is internal one, how to measure them online? When we talk about IV curves and uh, EIS, uh, how can we do it on a vehicle that is running? So attractive characterization. Uh, when it comes to the prognostics model, so we still have some issues about the model validation, the estimation of uncertainties. We need to improve the reliability. That means that uh, we need to improve also the, the horizon of uh, um, prediction because that will depend on the fault I have. So the horizon of prediction, it's somehow the time I have to correct my faults so that it doesn't fail. And the ability to make generalization, and this is very important. That means um, when we have historical data, if I don't have this ability of generalization, that means each time I have a new system, even the same supplier, I need to generate uh, historical data, which is almost not impossible. So the idea here, this, this functionality is very important. It will allow to have a consequent uh, historical data and use it on different systems. And of course here, and this is also important, we made the choice not to use knowledge models because of their, um, because of uh, they are comp um, costly, computationally costly. But the thing is that uh, as we see, when we have internal information like here, when you have this kind of information that we can get from uh, a physics-based model, then my uh, prognostics is improved, really improved. So. The question here is, and maybe this is something that we, we need to work on, is that uh, how to use knowledge data and simplify them, how to use simplified, simplified model. Here, uh, I will go to a part where we are, we are not specialists, but this is more, I think, more your expertise. And, uh, and we are trying to, uh, because when we have diagnostics and prognostics, it's not a finality. We have to make them communicate with the system. And this is where we need uh, some tolerance to the fault. If I take just the system, I know that I have a safe zone uh, where my performance, my, my system should work. And, um, and I need some methods that each time that he goes out of this zone, I need to bring him back. This is uh, the, the, the whole principle, whether it is maintenance or fault tolerance control. And, um, and here uh, we avoid uh, to use redundance of the material because we just want to implement on existing systems without changing the architecture. And also it is a matter of, uh, of uh, simplifying the system, not to have a very complex system. The cost also is a criterion. So yeah, this is the, this is the structure. And uh, for this architecture, I have a block of diagnostics that will check the consistency of the system with nominal condition gives a set of prob probabilities of the occurrence of faults, but it will also give a characterization of faults. A minima, we need the amplitude of the faults, which will reflect somehow the severity of it. And for the post-prognostic decision, uh, it will manage the uncertainties that are linked to uh, this block. That is, for example, the false alarm. It will also manage the communication and give the decision to the control. 
but also the logistic data exchange, inspection, sampling frequencies, and so on, and also uh, make the link to the maintenance. Here for the approaches, um, we are mainly working on active fault tolerance control. Uh, and the idea here is that the choice will depend on the natural faults we have that we detect, the information that we, we are, uh, that is available once we did our design, if we have uh, this module or not, um, and uh, how the system behaves in presence of faults, what are the redundancy that's, that is in the system. So all these criteria will allow us to make the choice. Uh, regarding the decision, we have uh, three, let's say, ground families of decisions, depending on uh, the time and the action we have. So at immediate actions, we have some the control, basic control of my, my system, which is, which is uh, operating, but I can change the parameters of my control. At middle and long term, uh, I can go through maintenance or uh, replanification of my mission. This is when I'm changing my load profile, and this is mainly when I have a hybrid system. And at longer time, we can go on return on to design, uh, advising on specific architectures um, to, to the supplier. So these are the criteria that we are choosing on the type of decision that we are taking on our system. And when we have this, um, this system, so uh, the criteria we need is that as we rely completely on the diagnostics, so we need um, that we have a, an accurate diagnostics uh, online and real time, also for the decision and the reconfiguration of my, my controller here. We have some metrics here that we want to meet is the residence time of a fault after correcting it should be as short as possible, the number of sensor I'm using, uh, the cost of the corrective action, and this is again, efficiency and penalty on the degradation and also the correction time. And this is just a simple example that we have been doing also on uh, flooding. So here, uh, this, is, uh, this is a fault tree so that we uh, extract the parameter that we use for our diagnostics block. So the diagnostic is a simple dynamic neural network that estimate cathode pressure drop and voltage. Uh, we choose cathode pressure drop because uh, it characterizes the accumulation of liquid water, but not the drying out of the membrane. So we could clearly separate between these two uh, states. And of course, non-intrusive, low cost, easy to measure. The output of my neural network here is just the probability of the fault and its severity. Uh, for my decision block, I, um, I have a confidence level on the false alarm management and uh, the students, so this is a PhD of Etienne Dijou, so he went through two corrective actions, uh, what he called fast decision and longer term decision. So the first one, uh, both were triggered, of course, by positive diagnostics and the first one will act on fast dynamics variables. So this is the flow rate in case of flooding. For the longer term, uh, he will act on other variables. Uh, it is especially when this action is not efficient enough. He knows it's not efficient enough when the fault comes back three times. So uh, this is the parameters of changing which variable he's controlling. And his corrective function was a very simple uh, fuzzy logic rule um, uh, to define an intensity, so this is the uh, variable, um, the value of the parameter he's changing. And yeah, and this is, uh, this intensity was decided by residence time of the fault plus the fault amplitude. Of course, we suppose that he has this information. So here he generated some, uh, some states of degradation, flooding, drying out, and he has a set of uh, nominal values. And this is the evolution of his system with three uh, short-term uh, actions and one long-term action on temperature. So the short-term was on uh, air flow rate and the oxygen flow rate, and uh, the longer term was on temperature. So this work is really basic one. Uh, normally, uh, he's uh, in September, from September on, he will start some testing, but on stack level, because that was only on single cell. So it's not really representative. 
but the idea was to just validate the approach and improve it on the stack. So here, uh, he just focused on water management and now we are trying to extend it. We are starting by starvation. Single cell stack, this is okay. And um, that was a, a real question is that when I'm choosing my action parameters, how am I sure that I'm not um, provoking another fault? I'm trying to correct one fault. So how to be sure that I'm not provoking another fault? So here he has been working on two approaches, which is the structural analysis. Uh, so this is something that make a link between constraints when I'm, I'm moving one, one, uh, one um, operating parameter, how it does reflect on other, other parameters. And the second one is that he's using prognostics. Each time he launched one action to see the future state of health and to predict it. Uh, from his work, the temperature seems to be an efficient uh, uh, parameters to mitigate the faults. Uh, the period of diagnostics is a very important. So how fast am I running my diagnostics? So when it's very short, uh, we don't have enough time to make the correction. And when it is too long, uh, then we have uh, a rapid uh, sequence of changes. So we need to find a compromise. And also the, the order where he engage the other variables is very important, whether he correct the temperature before or the other parameters. So it was also very important. So he did different simulation uh, to see in which, what is the more relevant order of this, these parameters. So um, for, this, for the, the other part, which is tolerance to degradation, I will just present, I'm, I will not go into uh, what has been developed, but I will just present the principle, which has been also discussed yesterday. So we have an estimation of my remaining useful lifetime. And the idea here is to use it as an optimization uh, criteria uh, so that I have the optimal uh, operation uh, parameter where I will put my system in. And so this is, uh, this is the, the idea of that. Um, there have been some works in here. So this is the work uh, that is still ongoing on, on this optimization. And here, uh, I just wanted to show you this because um, this is a European project where we could implement this, um, this part on fault, on degradation, but also uh, put in uh, a prognostic at the system level. And this is the European project that has been already finished. And this application is uh, is already on buses in um, in Eindhoven, so they are running with this technology in it. So, as a conclusion, I think uh, I'm a little bit uh, beyond time. So, as a conclusion, um, so regarding the mechanism of degradation, I think that we we have done a lot. Uh, I mean, generally, uh, the community, but we still need a better comprehension of this mechanism, their interaction the propagation laws. So I think that we really need uh, some more physical models, but how to use them. So this is also some challenges. Uh, we need to have a better representation of faults and how to define the frontier between faults, the multi-faults also. So these are still challenging. And uh, we need also better experimental protocols. Uh, really, uh, when we talk about approaches using data, so we need first to have reliable data, and this is still not uh, something that is reliable enough. Uh, and of course, yeah, how to separate uh, the reversible and the irre irreversible parts. From durability, uh, we need more reliable indicator of the degradation and also more reliable algorithm. Maybe the idea here is to go towards information fusion, whether it's uh, sensor fusion, parameter fusion, classifier fusion, but uh, the more I have algorithm, um, the more reliable my results will be, uh, more robust, sorry. Uh, we need also to have some algorithms that could deal with incomplete data, uh, which is um, uh, um, more likely what we will have on, on the field. Uh, so how can I, can I still deal with incomplete data. So we have some approaches in the lab of reconstruction of databases, but of course it is also associated with some uncertainties. For the val validation of prognostics, of course this is tricky. So uh, we have still some issues with how to validate it on dynamic unknown load profiles. So we have some approaches where we try to use temporal series to predict 
some usage and reconstruct the, the, um, the load profile and just use this load profile that is already reconstructed. And for the validation, we have to set some reliable accelerated stress tests. So um, here we are working on the lab on that. Uh, there are some, some protocols for this test but there are mainly, so it's the DOE who started with that. And I know that there are some teams that also has their own protocols. Now in Germany, for example, the Fraunhofer has that. But those protocols are mainly linked to one component. For example, I will have an EIST, which is linked to the membrane, one which is linked to the cathode. Uh, the problem is that we have a global degradation and uh, everything is interacting. So I can, it's very complicated now to have um, let's say a protocol which is at the level of the stack, the whole stack, and not only one uh, one uh, one component. So we are also trying to work on that by, for example, condensing some protocols or combining some, uh, but it's not uh, it's not reliable enough yet. And of course, and this is maybe something that is important for us is to work more on this part, how to link our monitoring with uh, with the control. So this is the, the conclusion about that. And uh, what about the resilience? So the idea is that we have this system with all these functionalities. And when we talk about resilience, so we are managing the expected and the unexpected. Uh, for example, I can just have a, a misusage of my fuel cell car. And this is something that was not really expected. I don't have data for that. So how can my system manage it? Uh, so for that, uh, we need, uh, for example, if I take just uh, the solution of uh, the fault tolerance and degradation. Um, so this solution must be sustainable. That means uh, that the new operating points must not cause other degradation. So this is what we talk about. Either we're using some approach for structural analysis of the faults or using a prognostics model to see how my system will behave. Um, considering the impact of fault on aging and modeling the evolution of fault of aging. So here, the idea is to introduce uh, the interaction between diagnostics and prognostics and uh, to have a degradation weight to assess the faults, for example, uh, whether it is from its nature, severity or residence time. And another thing that we are working on is the having some adaptive approaches. So we are adapting online the fault signature and each time we have a new case that is encountered, we add it to the database from learning. And here, uh, the, the last point, so is the management of unexpected event uh, that we, the system didn't see during tr the training. Uh, in that case, so the idea is maybe to use only the functionality detection and isolation and no more the functionality uh, identification and estimation so that we can allow uh, the system to learn from new uh, approaches and uh, just have more flexibility uh, for the restructuration. Here, of course, the idea is to still introduce some analytical and physical redundancy and also as much as possible uh, from the design part, having uh, a passive tolerance, including already something, uh, all the information that we need. Uh, so, Thank you very much. With that, I will end my presentation. And uh, of course, I'm, I will be happy to discuss with you any parts where I go fast or anything that is not clear. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it seems like the breaking condition. Uh, yes. Breaking. Yes. Yes. Do you have data, data, what variable or information can we try to, uh, to predict? Yes. This is, a, this is one of the difficulties we have uh, because our algorithm must also take into account uh, the dynamics of my operation. So for now, we are just trying to have this degradation under static operation mode. So fixing my operation points and see what is happening. Uh, there is some work who tried to take into account uh, uh, dynamic, but it's more complicated. 
it's really more complicated. So for now, we are just basing it on a static because then the only effect we have is the effect of degradation. And we, we are not introducing other effects which are due to, to the change of uh, parameters. Yes. Yes, yes. This is actually what we try to do. Uh, so for us, uh, we tried two things. We tried this for learning. Uh, we have a database, which is, for example, if I take uh, um, degradation of the catalyst, this is the example you get. So we take, uh, one data set where we generate this fault, and then we get the signature. If I have a good signature, good enough, so each new sample that has the same signature, I will put it on this one. So this is in case um, I don't, I, I just have, I um, have this data which is available. If I don't have data that is available, what we try to do is that we try to uh, understand the dynamic of each phenomenon. So this is, uh, this is for example, let me just go back to this, um, this scheme. Okay. Here, for example, uh, we try to use this, uh, this um, repartition of the dynamics of each phenomenon. And uh, when we analyze uh, our, our, system, our signal here, we try to see the frequencies that are contained in each uh, packet. And when, for example, if I have a dynamic that is within this range, I can associate it to more probably it's electrochemical phenomena. For example, slow phenomena would be maybe more fluidic or temperature and uh, faster phenomena could be electrochemical. So we try to make this link um, according to the knowledge we have on the dynamics of the, of the phenomenon. So this is the way we did it in case we didn't have uh, this uh, learning, but the work I showed you is based 100% on learning. That means if you have data about the fault you want to represent, then you can compare it because it's just comparison between signature. And I think this is important because, uh, because uh, then we can manage easily when we have combined faults that we cannot do easily with other approaches for the learning. I absolutely agree. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, so what I didn't say is that uh, using this approach came first from this project uh, about, uh, it was for automotive application. And they say, uh, we have only current and, uh, and um, voltage. We don't have anything else. So, and, and we don't want you to know what is inside. We just give you the system as, um, so this is how they call it. The stack is its own sensor. I have uh, current in, voltage out, and you just give me what, what are, it's kind of blind classification uh, without having this prior knowledge. So that was the first step. So this is how we use Wavelet and we didn't know uh, which class is what, but then after uh, we needed this expertise to say, 
uh, this class is flooding and this one. So I completely agree with you. And, and I think this is why I think that we should go through fusion of approaches. It's not only one approach. So this one could give results. Uh, other methods can give results and we can confront these two uh, to have the final. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. And this is also what we are today uh, noticing is that we need to go more towards physics to have this understanding directly from the model. Yes. 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 So yeah, we, we try to use as much as possible the uh, external, but it's not enough, of course. And for example, in the example I showed you, the internal variable that we, we were using are the resistance, internal resistance, uh, the OCV, and the limiting current also. Uh, but of course, we need more <laughs> characterization to extract them. But, but we, uh, uh, we, uh, we noticed that we can have a good representation of the degradation by combining this tree with the voltage. state of health. What is your definition of state of health? Yes, so um, the state of health, uh, we used to define it in our lab, we used to define it as um, is my system uh, failing or not? Is there any fault in my system? So deviation from nominal, something that we call nominal operating condition. And in that case, which fault? So for example, my state of health is flooding. Except that here in the definition, we will add to this the dimension of my age, the age of the fuel cell, <laughs> not my age, the age of the fuel cell. So it's, uh, for us, it's a combination between these two information, whether I'm in a faulty condition or not, and what is uh, the level of degradation I have. So, and, and this is uh, how we can use it inside this approach, because I need to have information about both. Yes. Yes. So, how do you then connect these, this from the state of health information? How can you connect uh, what is, what, in your opinion, what is a way then to connect it so that you can minimize the degradation rate of the system based on the operating condition? So, the way we are doing is. Uh very macroscopic we uh, this state of health is necessary to estimate the remaining useful lifetime of my system and once i have this remaining useful lifetime accurately uh, this is uh, one optimization uh, parameters of my uh, new set of parameters so i use it to optimize the new set of parameters it's like i'm moving my system from one region that was degrading to one that is less because this uh, remaining useful lifetime is minimized, right? So this is how we use it. And this is why actually for, for me, for fault tolerance control, we don't need to know about degradation. We need to know only about the fault, its severity and how to correct it. But if we are going through prognostics, we need to know about uh, the degradation state uh, as an entry of this. So this is why we combine both. But, but to answer your question, we are just doing it in a very simple way up to now, and this is actually ongoing. We are just calculating this remaining useful lifetime, and this is one criterion of optimization of my parameters. That's it. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh. In the the yeah, but then uh, you don't. Uh, so, for example, imagine that you have a diagnostics, uh, and then uh, it trigger some correction action. Uh, so, if my my diagnostic is too fast, is the period of diagnostics too fast? The system that doesn't have time uh, to stabilize the new because you are changing the operating condition. So the system will not have enough time to stabilize the new uh, uh, operating conditions. So that means you will still see some problems with your diagnostics, right? So this is why it, it should be a compromise about um, not too fast so that we let the correction action to take place, but not too slow because then we will have the, the um, risk that my fault is um, going worse. Uh, so yeah. It's just a compromise. And actually, we just did it with error. We tried different periods. And um, so I, I think we need to do better than that. Yeah. Um, so we have, for now, all we have done are modeling. Uh, we have done modeling. Actually, that was in the in the case of the project, European project that was implemented in buses that we have. Um, we have, uh, I have shown, but I could have shown some, uh, some slides. Uh, so in the modeling, we could extend the lifetime by th thousand hours on a system that was supplied by Elrinklinger. Actually, uh, this is a German supplier. And uh, it was funny because uh, they have really very reliable system that could resist all. We tried to generate some faults, but uh, it was uh, impossible to flood. It was impossible to degrade. Uh, so I don't know if it comes from uh, our simulation or uh, so we were very happy to say that by simulation it is 1000 but it doesn't mean anything if you don't validate it experimentally. So up to now we, we didn't validate it. I know the buses are running and there are discussion with the, with the partner because now the European project is already ended. So if we want to use their data we should have some collaboration, bilateral collaboration outside of the project. And they own the data now. So, but they are interested that we use this data uh, to validate this algorithm. So uh, we have something like 1,300 hours of life extension to validate the model, but we didn't validate it uh, experimentally. I hope we can do that uh, very quickly. But we have to wait until the stack is is uh, dead. And <laughs> but they are very strong, yeah. Yes. I, I, maybe I, I have not understood correctly. Um, when you, you are in a very high frequency uh, branch, you are damaging the system? No, no. Like yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, this is some some discussion we we were having uh, on the impact of the characterization on the on the on the lifetime on the durability of the stack. So, for example, when you run the impedance spectroscopy, it is not instantaneous, so it takes some time, and you are applying some uh, some fluctuation of current, and uh, and there are some work that say that. This is also induce some degradation. Current ripples and things like that could also induce some uh, some degradation, but there is also the duration. How long do we do it? And um, and I know that there are some works who assess even this degradation, and this is why they try to limit also the characterization because of that. Otherwise, we can do the characterization, but we have to assess how much degradation did I cause to my system with this with this uh, characterization. 
So that, that was the main idea uh, of limiting the number of characterization. But it's not only of degradation, it is uh, because I need all the time to stop the system. For example, for the application of the buses, they didn't want any characterization uh, just once per week when they put the, the bus in the um, reserve. I don't know what is the call. And this is the only uh, time they want uh, characterization because uh, uh, the car driver is very <laughs> expensive and it costs also time uh, and money. So there is this kind of consideration where limiting the characterization was also a, a strong criterion. Thank you. Thank you very much.